Aloha. Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, State Senator at ER Doc, here in my scrubs today with a good friend, George Green, who's the president and CEO of the HAH, which is the Healthcare Association of Hawaii. Good to see you, George. Thanks for having me, Senator. You bet. So, um, one of my favorite people, George, it's very easy to talk to you. Um, you have incredible expertise uh, with a lot of our hospital teams, our hospital executives. Why don't you give people a brief overview so they remember what the HAH does? Sure. Um, and again, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, we represent all of the hospitals in the state. We also represent um, the majority of the nursing facilities, home health, hospice, and durable medical equipment providers in the state. Um, we've just expanded and we're representing more and more of the assistant living facilities in the state as well. Um, what we do primarily is advocacy for those organizations. We advocate for them at the state level um, mm -hmm. with uh, legislators such as yourself. Right. And we also uh, travel to Washington, D.C. to work with our congressional delegation. And we also work with the relevant regulatory agencies, um, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, um, and primarily at the federal level, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. It's a big job. How, how big's your team? How many people do you have with you? Now we have a total of 17 people, um, and that doesn't count the consultants that we have on hand to help us with things like our community health needs assessment and um, uh, to help us with some of the work we're doing in D.C. Great. It's incredible. Yeah, lots of great people around you and lots of responsibilities. Why don't we dive right in and talk about uh, briefly the hospitals. How are our hospitals? How do they match up? Uh, to hospitals in the mainland. I know you had a lot of California experience and you've now had national experience, I think. How are we doing? We're doing really well. Um, you know, there's always areas where we can improve. Right. Um, but by and large, uh, I would say when you look at the job that our the hospitals are doing quality-wise um, and the services that they're providing for the communities around the state, um, we're just as good, if not better, than many other states across the country. Um, one of the things that we've undertaken is a program called Partnership for Patients, mm -hmm. um, and it's a healthcare engagement network. It's a program that was started by CMS out of D.C., and it is focused in on quality improvement. And um, we have done um, a lot better than many states over this past three years with regard to our work in quality. And, and frankly, I, I have to say thank you to you and your fellow legislators, but as we started this journey on quality, um, we came to you all and asked you to protect the conversations of that quality committee so that people would be free to um, discuss some of the things that are going on and share best practices um, with the goal being to improve quality, and it's really helped. Right. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, I think for people who are watching us, I think they need to realize that when you say protect that conversation, that's so people can be candid when we as doctors or hospitalists or administrators, if there are challenges, if there are even mistakes or um, outcomes that are bad for patients, we want to learn and we want to be right. better. And you guys were really terrific because right from the get-go, the Healthcare Association, you specifically, were able to recognize that quality questions were going to be the kind of the tune of this decade. And that has played out that way. And so by informing us that way and getting that protected conversation, which you guys recommended, I think Hawaii has been out kind of ahead of the crowd. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You do a lot of stuff there. I mean, I want to dive into some of the other uh, processes that you've taken up. Uh, community health, uh, community needs assessment, mm -hmm. right? This was something new three or four years ago that you initiated. Yes, um, it's actually a mandate of the Affordable Care Act that individual hospitals have to go out and every three years conduct, conduct a needs assessment of the communities that they're serving. Okay. And the idea there is that once they go through this assessment process, which um, requires them to look at data, mm -hmm. requires them to go through an interview process, right. and uh, requires them to um, place evaluations out there for the community to respond to and stakeholders in the community, they identify the top health needs of that community that they're serving. And then over the next three years, they target their community benefits programs to work with stakeholders such as the state, um, different nonprofits in the, or in, in the community right. to try and improve those health issues for populations that are most at risk. And where we're really unique is that although it's a requirement on all hospitals, the Affordable Care Act never said that you can't band together and do it as a state or do it regionally or for us do it by island. Right. And so we've actually become one of only two states in the entire country to develop a statewide community health needs assessment. And we break it down by island, so we have one overall needs assessment, but then that information can be broken down by island 
And then from there, that information can actually be broken down for each individual hospital. Um, so again, Hawaii is a leader yeah. uh, because our hospital leaders have come together and said, look, we're a collaborative group, we're a collaborative state, we're a small state, so we should do this together to try and improve health uh, across the state. Oh, it was smart because I, just from experience this past weekend, I did a three-day shift and, you know, I'm transferring from a critical access small hospital on Big Island, transferring a patient over to Queens, doing it seamlessly. I know what resources they have. They know the limitations that we may have on the neighbor islands. But because of this collaboration, small state, but island state, people are getting together. So again, it's terrific. What are some of our um, top needs? What came out of the assessments? Well, as you would imagine, um, to not to go through the laundry list, um, behavioral health is a huge challenge all across the state. Yeah. Diabetes is yeah. a huge challenge yeah. across the state. Um, you've got uh, cardiac issues um, in various communities. And then asthma is an issue across the state as well. Um, and then uh, when you take a step back and look at the overall pictures, and specifically for the neighbor islands, as you mentioned, right. the overall issue of access to care in some of the communities on our neighbor islands kept bubbled up as a huge issue for us. Yeah, it's, it really, I'm, I'm always happy to hear it kind of reiterated and confirmed because Frankly, that's that is what we've got. I had a, a you know a case the other day, a very sweet uh, person who needed placement because she had fallen in with the wrong person, young person. She had drug addiction issues. The case managers needed to get her to safety. We didn't have beds available immediately. That fell right into the behavioral health category and drug issues and a lot of interpersonal conflict stuff. And there's a lot of room to to improve and grow yeah, there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really a tough issue because, you know, you, you say behavioral health or mental health, but it is substance abuse. You know, a lot of times it dovetails with the homeless issue that we yeah. have here. Yeah. And so it's a really complex issue. And, you know, one of the things that we're doing in working with um, the state on some of their goals with regard to improving the homeless and behavioral health issue is reaching out to other states mm -hmm. where they have different models in place where providers are working with organizations such as the state and other community stakeholders and figuring out what would work best for our state. Because there are some models out there that have worked in different smaller communities. So, but it's it's really a tough issue to take on. It is. Each individual that you try to help, there are so many barriers and breaking through any mental health uh, concerns and pathology, just the illness itself, one of the toughest disease states to work on. But really, it's a person that you're dealing with right in front of you. And uh, you're rolling the dice. Even if you have all the services, mm -hmm. the success rate is low. Um, it's interesting. I think it's probably worth mentioning that one of your former protégés uh, who kind of um, cut her teeth, I guess, in healthcare. Rachel Wong is now uh, the human services director. Yes. So that kind of, I would assume, that kind of relationship, and that's a, a helpful uh, history to have. Yeah, I mean, having Rachel um, over DHS has been extremely helpful. Our partnership with them um, over the years has only grown and only improved. And, you know, some of the programs that we're working on, it's key for us to have a good relationship with them. So um, when Rachel was presented with that opportunity and she decided to step up to that challenge, frankly, and take on that large department, um, we couldn't have been more proud or, or happy for her, and, and she's doing a fantastic job. Well, it's got to be nice whenever you see someone that was part of your staff, you know, mature into a different position yeah. and, and yeah. have a different role. That's, that's really cool. So you said, uh, so behavioral health, definitely. I'm understanding that as much as 70% of those who are homeless in our community have some component of behavioral health challenges. Mm -hmm. So that's got to be a big part of the solution uh, for the EGA administration, all of us. Diabetes? Yeah, yeah diabetes, as, as you would imagine. Um, you know, I, I remember when I came here, the first few weeks when I came here seven years ago now, um, I was in a taxi and I was explaining to the taxi driver what I did and he began to tell me about his issues with diabetes and I asked him the last time he went to go check, get a checkup, you know, does he have a primary care physician? And the answer to both of those questions, one was, I can't remember the last time I went to a doctor and no, I don't have a primary care physician. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that's part of the problem here. Uh, because we need to educate people and we need to get out in front of the disease before they become so acute that they end up in the hospital and there are serious complications that then they have to deal with for the rest of their life. But there's, a, there's an extremely high percentage of diabetes across the islands. Yeah, it's a, it's a crisis really because it's both the crisis of too many people with diabetes, which is happening 
nationwide. And then the fact that you can't find a provider sometimes. Yeah. And our shortage, I think Kelly Withy speaks about that quite eloquently. She, and she's one of great. our partners, right? Yeah. And so she continuously demonstrates that we're 20 to 22 percent short, trying to fill the gap in, but it's a big challenge. It is a big challenge. And, you know, I, I know in my time here, you know, you've continually tried to, to chop down that tree, as it were, with some of the legislation that you've introduced, yeah. things such as loan forgiveness. And, you know, it's going to be a continual issue. And we as a community have to work to try and make sure we have enough physicians here yeah. um, to support the needs of the communities across the state. Yeah, if it doesn't happen even in our state, I'm hoping to at least weigh in on the next, um, at the next uh, presidential level and see if they won't help us with a national plan because I, I don't know if we want to even spell it out as national service, although I wouldn't mind, but there's such a need now in almost all the states. I, I think you would agree that all the states, especially those that are rural, have this problem. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question about it. You know, you look at the the rural areas even, yeah. not just the rural states across the country, right. they all have workforce challenges. And physicians, key component, but it's across the workforce right. for healthcare. Right. Um, and so it's an issue that we, we've got to tackle. We need to be working with departments of education and universities and community colleges to try and, and even all the way down into high schools, yeah. to try and educate people about the profession of healthcare. About, uh, you know, it's a challenging profession, but it has amazing rewards right and I think the more that we can educate people at an early age hopefully we can generate more people who dedicate their lives to working in healthcare yeah well this is not necessarily a PSA but if you're watching out there and you're young go into healthcare become a nurse become a nurse practitioner a physician assistant or a doc um, become a hospital administrator get into healthcare because you will find a job in the yeah. state of Hawaii oh there's no question you know uh, there's always going to be employment in healthcare yeah. you know it's one of the things that people are always going to need. And again, we have to start looking at this as preventative and educational so that people can take charge of their own health care, but there will always be work in the field of health care. Yeah, just 17 positions right in your office. Yeah, even. that's right. So, okay, the, the community needs assessment. When's the next one due? When do you... When are We're you just doing? starting. Um, hospitals are turning in the information to the feds this year from the last community health needs assessment. Mm -hmm. And so early next year, we'll start the process. It, and they're not due until three years um, from now, but um, we start the process early and get at it often um, so that we can identify those issues and then hopefully pull people together early to uh, target some priorities where we can share resources and really create synergy to work on those issues together. So next year, we'll, we'll pull that group together. If people wanted to read it or see it, uh, is there a place uh, online? Yeah, um, we have our executive summary, um, which is at our website, which is www.hah.org. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone's free to log on there and, and um, not even log on. You can just go onto the website and look at our reports, and they should be able to get a copy of our executive summary. I, I'd recommend people do that because I, I get a lot of reports, but that is one of the valuable ones that I see it it's very well thought out it's extremely collaborative and I'll tell you if someone wants the, the overview of healthcare challenges in the state of Hawaii that's definitely that should be their first read yeah it's it's a great manual to go to uh, you know as you've said senator for anyone just wanting to sort of look at the environment um, for healthcare um, as far as what the health issues are it, it's a great document to look at so it'll give you some great ideas as to the challenges we're facing across the state it's it's excellent uh, let's see you've got an annual event coming up what's that we about? do we do um, and this is probably the best thing we do every year it's our annual awards dinner yeah. um, and again I'm, I'm happy to be sitting here as is uh, one of our former <laughs> legislator of the we year award winners Senator Green um, it, it's, it's a night where we really honor those who are working on the front lines of health care. And this is everyone from housekeeping to all the way up to the docks, all the way up to administrators of facilities. And really what it does is it recognizes the fact that day in, day out, no matter the challenges, they are working to improve health care for the patients that they're serving. And everyone in any sort of health care facility and even those around the health care facility are eligible to be nominated. Cool. Some of the nominations come from within the field, right. but some of the nominations for what we call our healthcare heroes yeah. come from patients and their families who have had a great experience in a facility. Yeah. And so it's great because number one, once the award winners are not are identified, we get to go out and surprise them to let them know that they're winning this award. And oftentimes, 
they're just in shock. They've yeah. never been recognized in this way before. It's all videoed. And then we have to ask them to come to the event, which right. this year is October 29th at the Colau Ballrooms. And they oftentimes don't want to come. No, I don't want to be recognized publicly because we usually have around 500 people at this event. And they've never been in front of a crowd like that. More often than not, we're able to get them to come. Yeah. And when they receive that, uh, that reward and they're in front of their family and their peers and this huge group of caring people, there's not a dry eye in the room by the end of the night. And it's, it's all worth it. It's all warranted because, again, these are the individuals who actually touch patients on an annual day. And when I say that, I mean these are the people that are providing them with food, checking their diet, changing their laundry, the doctors that are taking care of them, the nurses that are taking care of them, the lab techs, the rad techs, the people who are being creative and coming up with programs to build around them so that they can be healthy and whole once they leave whatever facility they're in. Um, and again, these individuals never receive this sort of recognition. So for me, it's, it's one of the best things that we do and it's the best night of the year because this is what healthcare is all about. I love it. I think that's a great place for us to take our break. When we come back, Healthcare in Hawaii, I'm joined today by George Green, who is the President and CEO of Healthcare Association. He has an award ceremony coming up, recognizing those who are taking care of you out there in the community. Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, which is on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. Have a great summit. Take care of your mental health. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We are uh, here live on Mondays at 3 p.m. and we bring guests like our best health coach, Elena Maganto. Uh, eat well and follow her tips. Viva la comida saludable. Aloha, this is Reg Baker with Business in Hawaii. We're a show that broadcasts every Thursday at two o'clock. We would love to hear from you and you can reach us in several different ways. We have a hotline that you can call in at 415-871-2474, or you can email us at thinktechhawaii.com, or you can tweet us at thinktechhi. Looking forward to hearing from you and seeing you on our next show. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green from the Big Island of Hawaii. Today I'm joined by George Green, long lost, uh, friend, family member perhaps, um, who runs the Healthcare Association of Hawaii. Uh, in our first segment, we were talking about the great stuff that HAH does, creates the uh, basically a community health needs assessment, talking about the greatest challenges we have in healthcare in the state, particularly for hospitals and long-term care facilities, but all of our health conditions. He recognizes healthcare leaders and contributors to actual patient care in the state, which is really kind of a heartfelt mahalo to those out there in healthcare. Uh, does so many different things, helps represent the hospitals at the federal level and at the state level. So there's someone there who can decipher all the challenges, the new regulations, the quality programs that are out there. But you do so much more, George. You came to Hawaii seven years ago and initially put out a plan that now is law. Uh, it's, from my perspective, saving our hospitals to a large degree, called the Sustainability Acts. Could you unpack that a little bit for us? Sure, sure. So um, Hawaii has historically had um, one of, if not the lowest, Medicaid reimbursements in the country. And so that's the reimbursement that we receive um, from ultimately the federal government to take care of the Medicaid population. Um, we also have one of the lowest Medicare reimbursements um, in the country. And it's something that thankfully our congressional delegation is aware of and is, is constantly working with us to improve. Um, but when I, when I came here seven years ago, we were going through pretty significant budget deficits at the state level. Yes. And um, we realized that given uh, the financial um, situation that the state was in, we couldn't really go to the state and ask for improved Medicaid reimbursements. We had to do our part and we had to figure it out on our own as the state work through those budget deficits, which by and large, thank goodness, they have. Right. Um, so we did a lot of research looking at what has been done in other states that had poor Medicaid reimbursement, and we uncovered a program that required state enacting legislation to take advantage of a federal program that would essentially match funds right. that are sent from the state to recognize the care provided to the Medicaid population. 
And, and this is at the hospital at long-term care or hospital, facility level. Yeah, this is specifically for hospitals and nursing facilities. Okay. And um, so, you know, we went through probably about a year and a half's worth of due diligence. That due diligence was reaching out to other states and bringing back examples of where it was working really well, where it was working so-so, and where it frankly wasn't working that great. Right. Um, and at the end of the day, through a lot of education and dialogue with the state legislature um, and, and with our members, uh, we decided to try and enact this legislation. And you know, frankly, Senator, you were, you were one of our key champions as we went through what was a pretty difficult process um, in getting this legislation through the House, through the Senate, through conference, and sending it to then Governor Abercrombie. Um, I remember, we had a few moments in, right we, up to the last we, second. We, we, <laughs> literally up to the last second. Um, it, it, this, this one hung in the balance, and I can't tell you how many days I would go back to our team and say, it's dead. It's alive. It's dead. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, again, with major support um, from the legislature at that time, we were able to get this bill to right. Governor Abercrombie, and he signed it into law. And it has improved our Medicaid reimbursement to the point where, as you've noted, this is literally life's blood yeah. to some of the nursing facilities and hospitals in this state. The thing that's key is that even with this program, hospitals and nursing facilities still lose on providing care to the Medicaid population. Mm -hmm. And as you know, when you look at the reimbursement from Medicaid, just to give an example, prior to this program being in place, if it cost a hospital $1,000 to fix a broken leg, yeah. Medicaid was reimbursing that hospital $700. Yeah. After this program has been put into place, hospitals are now receiving about $830 still doesn't cover their cost, but it's better and allows them to focus on other programs and frankly, in some cases, keep certain services afloat right. otherwise that aren't providing revenue generation for them and in some cases, frankly, keep their doors open. Right. So this has been a key program. It's been in place for four years. Um, as you mentioned, um, with uh, Director Wong in place, our relationship with DHS has been really, really good right. and we're looking at the the fifth iteration of this program or the fifth year of this program and our dialogue with DHS is going really, really well. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much um, hopeful and, and believe that um, this program is going to continue to benefit hospitals and, and the people that they're serving and nursing facilities. Maybe for perspective, George, I think it's so valuable that you're able to explain that to people. How much money does that mean each year on average to, that comes to our hospitals and our, and our nursing homes? For hospitals, so as I said, let's say um, let's say there's about $70 million in care that's provided yes. to the Medicaid population that ultimately is not reimbursed to a hospital. Yes. This program is able to bring about 45 to $50 million in any given year to that's make up that $70 million shortfall. Yes. So hospitals are left with still a 25 to $30 million shortfall, but prior to this program, it was $70 million that they were losing. Wow. For nursing facilities, it brings in about $10 million, mm -hmm. um, which again makes up uh, about $20, $25 million, um, with their overall shortfall being $20, $25 million, so it almost cuts it in half. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I think that people need to kind of take a step back and look uh, at the big picture, and that is that without the program that you proposed, really it was you guys, yeah. you specifically, uh, I think we would have seen more hospitals go the way of uh, HMC West. Mm -hmm. When West closed, it was just too late. Uh, now, of course, we have a, a great partner in Queens, mm -hmm. and we're so so honored to have them take over uh, the responsibilities there. But had not uh, your proposals come uh, and borne fruit, I think that we would have seen a series of hospitals fall like dominoes. That would have been devastating to a lot of the different communities. Uh, yeah. I. I, I I will tell you that um, on the day that HMC East and West were set to close their doors, and you'll remember this, there were approximately 28 patients that they hadn't been able to find placement for. Yeah, I forgot about that. And many of those <coughs> patients no longer had any sort of insurance coverage or their insurance coverage had uh, run out. And to this day, I use this example as a testament to the way that our healthcare providers in the state, for all of our warts, step up when the community needs it because within a week each of those 28 patients had a home yeah. had a facility 
that took them in to take care of them, in most cases knowing that they weren't going to be re reimbursed for that care. But, and that's what, our, that's what our healthcare providers do. From my perspective, in the time of need or in a time of need, they put competition to the side, mm -hmm. they put their payment or reimbursement to the side, and they try and do what's best for the community. And you're absolutely correct that without this program in place, there may actually be some facilities that would close, yeah. but for sure there would be facilities that would have to shut down some services, yeah. which would mean even less access in the communities across the state. So it's, it's a vital program, it's an important program. Um, thanks again to you for helping us through that process and helping us to educate legislators and continue to do so. Because as you know, when legislators change, we have to go in yeah. and go through the same process of educating them about this important program. So, And it was unique too, because that was something that was totally new. And uh, it was new not just to them, but you know, you had to really educate those of us who work in healthcare, the, the few of us that are at the Capitol and, and the administration. And, that was a big lift that you were able to pull off. That that alone, there's so many good things that the Healthcare Association does that we're only touching on a little bit today, but that uh, new plan, that program, which brings in, you know, like you just described, you know, $50, 60000000 million in aggregate per year, every year mm -hmm. that we would not have seen otherwise, that does make the difference. And I think it makes it easier for people to collaborate. I think that when you have very good people like Art over at Queens and Ray over at Hawaii Pacific Health and you know Marianne at Kaiser and so on and so forth, they, they do all intend to work together. Mm -hmm. Jairus over at, at the medical school, everyone's working together. But when there's a little bit of breathing room, which is really what you were able to provide, mm -hmm. it makes it easier for them to say, okay, let's pause for a moment. If we are gonna move some patients, let's not worry solely about economics which they don't have to worry only about. We can also additionally focus on this crisis at hand. So when, whether it's West closing or hospital going on divert or someone losing staff. Uh, you know, sometimes we lose staff on the neighbor islands for right. psychi psychiatry program here or OBGYN program there. We need someone else to step up. Yeah, and you know, I, I think one of the, the key factors that we have to hone in on here and remind people of is that this important program, which brings these additional funds in from the feds, it doesn't require one state dollar of appropriation it requires not one tax dollar from the citizens across this state. This is all revenue that comes from the feds, and in fact, the hospitals and the nursing facilities have to take from their general operations in order to utilize this program. And trust me, in the beginning, they were scared. They were just giving money away that they did not have to give away. Yeah. Because the way the program works is this money is put up, and then the feds match it, and then it comes back. But thankfully, <laughs> the program has worked. Um, but again, you know, when we get into these conversations, um, I would be remiss if I didn't remind your audience that, um, you know, this is not costing them one tax dollar and, and really isn't um, costing the state any, any money. And in fact, it generates revenue for the state to the tune of about all in 10 to $12 million a year. So it's a program that's a win-win for everyone um, without the state or the public having much skin in the game. It's great. Just have a few minutes left. Uh, I wanted to touch on uh, preparedness for natural disasters and you guys deserve a lot of credit you stepped up when we had uh, the concern about Ebola and other infectious diseases uh, could you comment a little bit about what Healthcare Association uh, does in that area sure um, so we are the pro we are the organization um, that runs what's called the Emergency Preparedness Program yes and we receive grant funding from the feds to handle developing caches of supplies across the state mm -hmm. so that if there was a man-made or natural disaster, we could literally stand up hospitals if needed in order to take care of patients. We also provide training to all of the healthcare providers across the state as to how they should operationalize if there were a man-made or natural disaster. We even have programs in place now um, to educate about active shooter situations. And so, um, and then in the event of a natural or man-made disaster, we have a volunteer workforce led by um, grant-funded staff that uh, operationalize and actually 
get in there and help with all the patients, all the facilities, all the communications, hand in hand with the state, city, and counties um, to manage any sort of disaster situation. So it's just, you know, I know we have very few minutes left in our program, just a few seconds, but I wanted people to know that there's someone out there working on our hospitals, our long-term care facilities, trying to keep these facilities up and running mm -hmm. to provide healthcare services, but also if God forbid we ever have a severe need, we've got some experts there. Yep, we've got a great team in place. Okay, well thank you, George, for joining me. Thank you for running the Healthcare Association. Yeah, thanks, Josh. And we'll have you back again to talk about these health heroes in our community. Absolutely, thanks for the opportunity. You bet. This is Josh Green, Healthcare in Hawaii. I've been joined today by George Green, who's our executive CEO and president of the Healthcare Association. Thanks for joining us.